so I started writing this really, really nice, um, you know, lecture. And then I started cutting it in like cue cards, you know, like this. And then I had the slides. I said, okay, when is the slide going to be shown? So I stuck the slides behind the sentence where I'm going to talk about it. And then everything was getting mixed up. And I thought, oh my God, what am I going to do? So uh, I met a friend who is like um, uh, an inspirational speaker. And he said, throw all of this away. You don't want that. These are kids. You know, they don't want to listen about talks about theories and theories of learning and whatever and tell them the stories and I thought hang on a second I love stories I actually write stories I write stories for my grandchildren and um, so I thought okay let's go on with that and within the stories you will realize what I'm trying to get to your heads you know as kids so right now um, can you guess my age I don't want to answer, please be have, have mercy on me. I'll let you know that at the end. But, you know, coming to the age, age is just a number. You don't really need to know how old you are. You need to know what you are going to achieve today, tomorrow, and the future. And that's so important because without achievement, people wither and die. It's like a, a plant not being watered. That's the achievement that makes you grow, not the number of years. And, but, my prin the principle that you have to live on is the continuous learning, the lifelong learning. And that's what I call myself. I'm a hypochondriac of lifelong learning. I want to learn every day, every minute of the day. I cannot leave a minute that is not being used. So, uh, well, they told me I'm coming, came from Bahrain this year. I actually lived here for 35 years. We just moved uh, the luggage still sitting in the house. The packs are not opened, and I think a lot of the boxes were broken, but that's beside the point. While I was writing for you, <laughs> that happened. Anyway, so uh, that's why let me start from the start, when I was little. And we had a lot of kids. I'm a member of 13, the eldest of 13 children, family. My dad used to always go to England for his eye problem. You know, before they had, we had diseases in Bahrain that affects one or two eyes. So he would leave us with the, you know, with the whole family in a big house. We had a cow in the backyard. And the women would gather and smoke the Hubble bubble. We call it Gadu in Bahrain. And, you know, I was intrigued. You know, they all sit and clean vegetables, cut onions, and do all sorts of stuff and talk about current affairs at that time. I can't remember what they talked about. I was intrigued. You know, like, I want to sit and hear them. They would kick me out. Go out. So I'd hide behind the door. And listen to them. The kitchen was a bit big because we were like 20 families living there. Anyway, so then we went to school. And in school, it was like also very inspiring. I want to go to every class, you know. But then the moment I found what I wanted was when we started biology. And we started dissecting animals, you know, birds and frogs and stuff. So I, we used to go. We had streams in Bahrain that are full of frogs. So we used to go to the streams. We would walk like 45, 50 minutes to reach them, collect these frogs. They were waiting for us, looking. They were not frog princes. And um, <laughs> looking, oh, my God, my guts will be out. So we'll take these frogs, put them in boxes, go home, and, you know, pin them and cut the thing. I can tell you what's inside the frog, but you don't want to know that. So, I mean, we learned it. We cut so many frogs and birds, you know, pigeons and little swallows and whatever, you know, and we learned all of that. But at the same time, we had other stuff to do. You know, for example, my dad would come back and he would bring these books with them and hide them so we can't read them. You know, some of them were love stories and detective books. So when he goes to sleep, he's a very deep sleeper. We'll steal the key and go to his cupboard and take all these books. I will sit and read them and hide them when he wakes up. Then he gets the newspapers, you know, with him when he comes back and Come and sit with, read with me, you know, and of course, no English at that time. So I would make a lot of mistakes and he would read properly. What's so wrong with you? And another hit, and we were like having so much fun reading. So anyway, and then we learned cooking and sewing and all of these things. And we would invent games. So because, you know, at that time, no, uh, no PlayStation, no TV. I think with the TV was 
like functioning for maybe four hours only a day. And it was golf the whole day. So I don't know why people would play golf, but a stick and a ball anyway. So we would, um, you know, spend our time doing things, you know, like we had no time. We used to get tin fells. Have you seen the tin fells? The, has anyone used the tin fells from the audience here? I don't think so. That was our daily allowance. We used to save that for going on the annual trip every year. And also we used to, you know, exchange comic books. The comic books those days, which is Superman, Batman, and whatever, all of these guys, uh, Spider-Man, of course. They used to come in 12s, you know, like they packed them in 12s. I'm sure, a few, I don't know if you remember them. I think they come from Egypt as well at that time, translated into Arabic. So that was the most fun we would have, is when we sit and read those comic books. Oh, my God. So anyway, that's all gone, finished. I got the scholarship. I went to university. Of course, I studied a lot. You know, don't take me wrong. I'm a, you know, I love to study. But I did all sorts of stuff. I gave speeches, took the kids on trips. We rented boats. We did everything that we can do without our parents' knowledge. And uh, I sang, I performed, you know, I acted in plays. I actually sang Fairuz, you know, like for, uh, I think, 2,000 people. So really, I mean, I don't know how to sing, but I did that. Then came back home and went for my first job, learning all the time and reading and whatever. And the interviewer asked me, amongst the questions, what's the capital of Portugal? And I said, Barcelona. They, he looked at me and then, anyway, I got the job. Six months later, the same interviewer said, told me in the corridor, he said, hey, Saad, what's the capital of uh, Portugal? I said, Barcelona, of course. Why are you asking me this all the time? He said, it's wrong. I said, what? You gave me the job. He said, well, <laughs> it, you said it in such a conviction that I thought, oh my God, she must be right. I went home, opened the atlas, and I saw, it is Lisbon, it's not Barcelona. I mean, why is she so confident in herself? Anyway, I said, oh my God, and you gave me the job for something wrong. Then the second interview, uh, well, I came to Dubai, worked in Dubai Aluminium, and then I wanted to become a teacher. So I went for an interview at the Higher College of Technology. A bunch of Canadians were sitting there, all men, one woman, and they said, you know, amongst the questions, principles of uh, accounting, accounting ratios, give them a mock talk about accounting and so on. And they said, uh, right, so what do you do for stress? I said, stress? What's that? And they all laughed. And I'm thinking, why are they laughing? You know, <laughs> I don't know the question. <laughs> They're laughing about it. So I thought, okay, that's it. I'm not getting the job. Went to the office really, really like upset. And the guy said, I had 28 accountants and me only working in Dubai Aluminium. They said, so what happened? I said, I don't know. They asked me what's stress, and I said, what's stress? And I laughed, and they laughed. They said, oh, my God, you don't know the, the meaning of stress? I said, well, I do in the aerodynamics and mechanics and stuff, but not on a personal level. Of course I don't know stress. They said, stress is when you are under pressure, idiot. I said, oh, my God, they won't give me the job. So anyway, I got the job too, but I didn't take it. <laughs> so what I'm trying to say here is it's okay to do mistakes. It's not bad. All of us do mistakes. Like if I can do them, anybody can do them. If I can do good stuff, anyone can do the good stuff and the mistakes as well, provided you learn after that. Of course, after the Barcelona incident, I had to go and learn all the capitals of the world. So, <laughs> well, anyway, so... I love writing a lot. You know, we read a lot, and then you feel you could contribute to the society. So when I first started this business, I thought, I'm going to write for the students, you know, to make them change their minds, you know, be communicative, be energetic, be creative thinker, and, you know, tell them about all the stuff that they really require when they go to university and on their own in the world. But no one would publish for me. I said, why are they not publishing for me? You know, like, these are good stuff. So I didn't waste time. I published myself. I created my own magazine. You know, there are more of them here. 
you know, and started publishing on my own. Someone asked me when I did, this is my, the final one, this was done 2014. Um, where is the ministry approval? I said, ministry approval? I didn't know I required a ministry approval. So all along I was printing books and publishing magazines on my own without even asking anyone. And you could do that. You could do anything that you want. Actually, the talk that I, will, uh, I was supposed to give you is going to be on my blog, which is in my name. So, you know, I'm full of myself. I have my own blog in my name. So, yeah, but, so communication, talking to others, 4.0 4. 4. 4. GPO is fantastic. Everybody wants that. But when you submit for your master's degree to a university, they are not going to look at your 4.0. They want to know what have you done in school? What have, you, what have you given to the world? What have you achieved other than the 4.0? They want you to be communicative. They want to see the best personal statement that has ever been written, a story, a poem. I have a student who was accepted to medical school because, of, because she writes poems. You know, they thought, oh, she must be very sensitive, so she'll care about the patients. She was 89%, you know, 3.2 GPA, but not 4 and, you know, it's fantastic. You can have both, you know, best of both lives. So the reason I'm talking about the communication and this, there is a study that has been done by um, a guy called um, Hilton and another guy called Pellegrino. You know them, right? Hilton is the hotelier and Pellegrino is the water maker, you know, the water seller. So they're giants. So they commissioned the research. In the research, they found, uh, you know, they found, they wanted to see um, the uh, foundation of the 21st century. And the main foundation is the skills that people own because we are no longer workers in factories. Robots do that. We are here to talk to people, to think, to uh, communicate, to collaborate. So they found that these four skills are actually not there. You know, no one have them from the student. They are not even taught to the students in schools or in colleges. When I was teaching my kids, you know, accounting, they have no idea how to work together in projects. You know, one person will be working, the others will be twiddling their thumbs, talking to the girlfriend, doing whatever, but no collaboration projects. And the projects, there, there's no creativity, you know? They, you know, think, what the hell? Did you just copy it from, the, from Google? Um, and so these, Four skills are really, really required. Imagine yourself, you know, that you are asked to run a company. What would you need to run the company? You would need these four skills, communication, collaboration, critical thinking, and uh, what's the fourth one? Critical thinking. Yeah, and creative thinking, okay? So four things you would need to run any company. If you don't have them, Whatever you studied in university does not even count. I'm telling you. I want to add the fourth one, a fifth one. Number P, power of positive thinking. The power of positive thinking is you are thinking what you want to be in the future and you can have it today. I want to be a writer. Now I am a writer. I wanted to be a CEO. I am a CEO now. I wanted to own my own company. I did own my own company. I wanted to own my house. I'm not a rich. I'm not the most entrepreneurial of the, in the world, and I'm not the, bo the, mo the most communicative in the world, but I was able to achieve what I wanted to achieve, despite being a woman, despite having a staff, despite having all the obstacles that can happen in the world to, to any person. It's not an easy, smooth life, okay? But I want to just go back a, a bit to my father, my dad used to tell us stories all the time, you know, no TV, and especially the verses of Quran. So one of, you know, he explained, so we learned the Quran, but just by reading Quran, you can't really know it. So he would act for us the verses. And one of the verses was about Prophet Moses. How many of you read Quran? Oh, okay, quite a few, good. Uh, so Prophet Moses, when he was called to the mountain and God was talking to him, he said, What's that in your hand? He said, well, it's my stake. Now, that's my, how my dad would say it. 
So what do you do with the stick? He said, well, I, you know, lean on it and, you know, say this, to do this on the sheep. And I've got other uses for it. So we all, you know, we are 13. We ask that, what are the other uses? What are the other uses? And he would run after us and hit us with the stick. And that's the other use, you know. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so that's, that's uh, what my dad used to tell us. And the reason he would tell us all of this is because we want to also have the, the comical side of religion. And he would say to us that religion is fine, you know. You can follow it, but you are not going to be directed by religion or by anything in the world. You direct yourself to the good of the world. I like the guy when you talk about sustainability, which is thinking about the third or fourth future generation. This is what we all have to think about in all the ways. Leaving a legacy behind you like a piece of writing or, you know, a little book or a story. Like my dad died 20 years ago, but I still remember all his stories. That's legacy. And I'm telling them to my grandchildren as well. They will remember them. That's what you need to do is the legacy. The final note is, I came here today because in February, someone, I was reading my favorite author, Elif Shafak, and someone said, oh, she has a TED Talk. I said, really? Send me the link. So I watched her TED Talk, and I said, hmm, I must do a TED Talk. And guess where I am here? <laughs> I'm in front of you doing a TED Talk, you know, teaching you about things that are nothing to do with universities and colleges. Although I'm a promoter of universities and colleges, thank you very much.